One of the things I see with ADHD women entrepreneurs is even if you're really, really good at being able to get yourself to do stuff and you can push and push and push, although then you crash later, maybe. I find that there is a time when at one point, most ADHD women entrepreneurs get stuck. And this is whether you masked through overfunctioning and high achievement as a child, like I did, or maybe you identify as more of an underachiever and people told you if you just applied yourself, you would do so much better, right? And you might be somewhere in between, but regardless of which camp you're in or what area in between you're in, one of the things I notice with most ADHD women entrepreneurs is that you get to a point where you just can't. And here's the thing, I get it. With ADHD, we, our brains function different, differently. We have some different wiring in terms of how our executive functioning is. And so for sure, having our ADHD brains function in a society designed for neurotypical brains or not ADHD brains can be hard. I mean, it is hard if you're trying to function that way. And so you will bump into trouble at different points anyway. However, I think I see something more than this. It's more than just the distraction, the procrastination, the difficulty focusing, uh, difficulty sustaining attention, being able to identify what task needs to happen, struggling with multiple tasks. What I'm talking about that I see is much deeper than that. And that when an ADHD woman has unresolved stuff that I'm about to talk about, then those other things get harder. And what I see, and this is just what it looks like when I see this, is like these brilliant women who maybe have been high achieving before or have had a business before or done really well in a career, all of a sudden get to entrepreneurship and they've got so many brilliant ideas. They don't, they're so burned out, they can't even, they can't bring them to fruition. Or perhaps they have they're struggling so many things simultaneously that stuff gets mixed. Like they miss huge swaths of detail and end up having to do everything last minute, right? Especially in a launch, like, shoot, I should have written those emails, right? (laughs) Things like that. Or getting just being afraid to put themselves out there on social media or someplace else, really putting themselves out there, saying the things they want to say. And then if they do get negative comments, just rumbling or fearing rejection so they don't say what they want to say or they avoid social media altogether because they don't like it, which I get it. Like you don't have to like social media. And if you're going to have an online business, it's pretty much part of the deal with probably a few exceptions. So if this is you and you see yourself in any of that, first of all, I want to say I get it and you're not messed up. It's just that you're struggling with what I call invisible ADHD obstacles. And to talk a little bit more about what I mean about that, I'm first, I'll be specific. I'm talking about things like fear, doubt, even insecurity or overwhelm. And a lot of really hmm, overachieving, high, high functioning, over functioning ADHD women, which I would put myself in that because that's how I made it through grad school, all the way through grad school and through most of my first part of my private practice as a therapist business. And a lot of people be like, well, I'm not scared, whatever. But then what you'll see is that fear is sneaky. It'll show up in ways where it's like uh, struggling to get yourself to do stuff. It's like, oh, I don't have time because I have to do this other thing, right? Like the distractibility goes up. And again, I'm not saying that distractibility isn't part of ADHD. But what I've noticed, I've seen patterns of it, is when people have inner stuff, parts of them that are holding fear or doubt that come from old stories, then getting themselves to do the things they need to do for their business, being able to focus on it and see it through to completion gets way harder, way harder than it's ever been for them before. And to me, that says it's not just ADHD. And I see this showing up in a couple of ways. One, 
a lot of people with ADHD, most of us were undiagnosed, at least if you're in my generation, I'm a Gen Xer, we were undiagnosed. And so we just were like shamed and criticized. There's actually Michael Jelinek, he's a psychiatrist out of Stanford, I believe, who, or maybe it's Harvard, estimates that by age 10, starting at school age to age 10, ADHD kids receive 20,000 more negative, critical, or corrective comments than their non-ADHD peers. Think about that, 20,000 more negative comments. And actually, that was a conservative estimate. Like, I did the math on that because, you know, former math geek here, but I did the math on it. And that's only like nine extra comments a day. And I don't know about you, but even though I was over-functioning and high-achieving, so I was a rule follower, perfectionist, people pleaser, ADHD still comes out. I would still get in trouble for talking or blurting out or, I mean, talking mostly. <laughs> but I was, in other ways, I was able to mask my ADHD through pushing, over-functioning, high achievement, things like that. But it still happened that those negative and critical comments happened. It would happen about my bedroom. It would being too messy. It would happen about the way I was organized wasn't the way someone else thought I should be organized. And so for you, that may look like some of those things. It may look completely different. But the fact of the matter is, is as kids, we were exposed to way more negative and critical comments. And what that does to a kid is you start to believe that you're somehow defective, that you're not good enough, you're too much or not enough, <laughs> kind of the same issue, but on different ends of the spectrum. And you get this idea that you're not doing it right, you're different in a bad way, and you're just kind of skating by and the day's going to come, even if you're a high achiever like me, the day's going to come when you just, people find you out, right? They find out that you don't know what you're doing. And this experience tends to be fairly common, whether you're high achieving and, or maybe you felt like you were underachieving. You heard the you're not applying yourself kind of message all the time. And what that does is those messages about correcting you, criticizing you, even shaming you for your ADHD, which is something you couldn't help, that builds up. It builds up and creates wounds. And also creates a narrative very similar to what was said to you. It creates limiting beliefs about what you are and are not capable of. And then those limiting beliefs manifest in fear, doubt, insecurity, overwhelm. And I'm not saying you don't feel those feelings. You do feel those feelings. But sometimes those feelings are rooted in older stories that you were told were the truth, that you talk too much, you blurt out, you're rude, you're inconsiderate, you're whatever, right? You're not applying yourself, <laughs> whatever the, the list is. For me, I was, like I said, I was over-functioning and high-achieving. So I tended to get more of the social commentary, but other kids, maybe you got more the, you're not trying hard enough, you're not applying yourself, or some ADHD kids, just adults, tell me as kids, they just felt plain stupid. When they weren't, they were smart as hell, but just not taught in a way that worked for the ADHD brain. And so the reason this is important is when we have these invisible, like these inner ADHD obstacles that aren't directly related to ADHD, but are a byproduct of growing up in a neurotypical society that is hell-bent on trying to make you act neurotypical and also shaming you for, for being ADHD, right? When you grow up in there, you can end up adopting these beliefs that society taught you. And then those beliefs keep you from being able to be bold and put your big self out there in your business. And so that's when you start to see things like, I don't know, I don't know what to do. I've got all these ideas. And really that's fear of like, you might choose the wrong thing, right? Or oh, I don't, this is a bold comment. I don't want to put that out there. People might say something and that's not trusting that you can handle rejection. That's the whole rejection sensitive dysphoria that you hear people talk about. There's so many different ways this shows up. And why is this important? This is important. Because helping you in your business with ADHD is not just about tips, tricks, and strategies. I mean, you do need to have 
ADHD specific tips, tricks, and strategies, tools. You need ways to do things that are aligned with the way your ADHD brain is. But if you only do that and you never address these inner underlying obstacles, these old limiting beliefs that you got from being told that you were too much or not enough, then you're going to struggle in your business. And it's important to have compassion for yourself around this because you come by it honestly. And the parts of you that are keeping you small are just trying to help. They're trying to help protect you from having to go through that criticism and judgment and corrective and negative comment again. But the problem is, is where you're going now with your business, it's not a fit. And so the work is to figure out how can you do that deeper work? How can you work with those invisible obstacles so that they no longer hold you back? And now you're just dealing with your ADHD brain in a neurotypical world. And, you know, there's ways you can modify your business in your life so that you live and work the ADHD way. So you even have less exposure or issues with that. Right. So if this was interesting to you, I'd love if you'd leave a comment or a like or even share if this might resonate with someone and be sure to subscribe to my page. Take care.